Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the December 10th meeting of the Capital Planning Committee. Um, it being seven o'clock, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, I have a statement to read just before we move into the agenda items. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending privileges, provisions of the open meeting law, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitation on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. Specific information and the general guidelines for remote participation by members of and or parties with a right or requirement to attend this meeting can be found on the town's website at www.chumpsfordma.gov. For this meeting, members of the public who wish to watch the meeting may do so by accessing the Chumpsford Telemedia website, www.chumpsfordtv.org. This meeting is being video recorded by Chumpsford Telemedia and will be rebroadcast at a later time. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, post on the town's website an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting. Uh, tonight, first on the agenda, we have, uh, we'll be hearing reports and presentations uh, from a number of department heads. And I wanted to mention that um, first on the agenda is the town clerk's office. I spoke with Trisha this earlier this week, and she had um, asked that we defer her project uh, for one more year. This will give her additional time to um, consult with um, two departments, facilities, and the fire department, and gather some more detailed information. So. With that being said, um, for the next uh, department on the agenda is the library. And with us tonight is our library director, Becky Herman. And also, uh, I know I saw him here, and Mike Harridan is also, and our library trust, Bill Kenny, is also with us. I just. Uh, I just wanted to mention before Becky gets started that the uh, library projects are number of, numbers five through nine, and they're found on pages three through seven of the handout. Oh, am I all set to go then? You are. Good evening, Becky. Oh, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for uh, hosting us. And I wish we were seeing you in person, but this Zoom format has become very familiar to us all, I think. Um, we have five different projects, which sounds like a lot um, for us to present tonight. Um, we, uh, many of them are things that we have presented in previous years. So they're just, they've been in the queue for a little while. Um, and we understand that, you know, everything can't be funded in every year, but we wanted to make sure that we brought you up to date on the things that we were hoping for. Um, the first one that we have listed is the computer replacement. And um, as we've talked about before, when I am, uh, have presented here is uh, computers are very much like pens and pencils these days. And, and someday it would be nice if these were included in our operating budget, but um, the practice in, in the years past have been that we would, we would have um, them as a capital request. So we replace our computers on a four to five year cycle um, this is, we're now, this is the second year, or the fifth year of our four to five. So this is, um, we're still, we had capital funding last year where we bought, we um, have the funds to um, buy 21 computers this particular year. And then um, this is a request to complete our buying cycle so that we would purchase altogether in FY 21 and 22, 37 computers. Um, Mike Harridan is here, who is my technology and facilities person. And Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the computer needs and, and what this request entails? Yeah. Um, so we're replacing um, a number of systems in this. This cycle includes mostly systems in use by patrons, including iPads in the children's department, a new scanning system for the microfiche reader, um, 
new general purpose computers to be used um, throughout the building and in the McKay Library, um, as well as some number of computers for staff members, which is kind of a fluid situation depending upon maintenance needs and staffing levels and that sort of thing. Um, all the computers are running in the library right now um, are running Windows 10. We've standardized on that and um, quite a number of years ago, actually. Um, this year, there's some additional accessories we're purchasing, which you might find of interesting. We're finding, as you, some of you may have um, seen, that video web cameras are in high demand and very short supply. So we've, we've decided to move towards um, <clears throat> large flat screen monitors with built-in webcams. Um, we only have a few of those in the library now, but we found that we need more. And so that adds a significant expense to the cost of the monitors. If I can just chime in and say that, um, you know, because we've been working, you know, remotely, I mean, sometimes we were in March, April, May, but, and then we've also been doing all of our programs virtually um, since, since we reopened to the public in July. Um, and actually March, since March, we've been doing remote programming. Um, we have, for instance, we're doing seven story times a week um, that, that we have sometimes multiple computers that are being used because one of Staffer will be on the laptop and, and coordinating the commenting part of it. And the other one will be doing the actual story time. And then we have a way to do the Zoom thing where the audience can actually see each other too with permission. So it's, um, we, we're really kind of pivoted and are, are ending up doing a lot of our programming um, virtually. And I think it's something we're gonna to continue to do when, um, even when we do open even anyways, because uh, we're reaching groups that we couldn't reach normally. Uh, parents who are home with their kids that weren't able to travel out for programs at night and um, seniors who don't want to travel after dark. And we're getting wonderful numbers. We're getting between 30 and 50 people for evening and adult programs um, each time that we offer them. So. The other thing I think, Mike, that you, you uh, we often mention is that people ask us, what do we do with our, our uh, older computers? Yep. Maybe you can address that. Yep. Well, we follow the town's policies and the first, um, potential home for them as we ask the town's IT department if they have any need for some of the computers when we're finished with them. Um, they say yes or no. If they say no, then we offer them to the school department. Um, they've taken a number of our systems in the past. Um, if they, the school department says no, we might, we try to find some sort of a charitable organization to donate them to that's hit or miss, but worst case, worst case they get recycled. Yeah, and our and our friends have taken a few of them because um, for using them for uh, their their fundraising and um, and some of their budgeting stuff too. So. Those computers are usually about eight years old at that point. Right. Does anyone have any questions about this particular request? I can't see if anyone's raising their hands because I'm in the this, but <laughs> just speak no. now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> All righty, so I guess we could go on to the next thing. Darling moves on to carpet replacement. So if you've been in the library in the last couple of years, then you saw the transformation on our, our uh, first floor as you walk in and then the, the basement floor, or the, the uh, reference floor we also um, had done. And when we had originally made a request for the whole library to be recarpeted at the same time, but this committee, the Capital Planning Board suggested that we phase it. So we divided it into three different prop, uh, phases and we did FY19 was when we did the main area and FY20 um, uh, was when we did the children's room in the lower level. And then we are now still waiting on the administrative offices. Um, and the break room and uh, some of the places where <laughs> actually the carpeting is the worst. But um, so we did defer that last year. And so we just wanted to continue to have that in as a request. Um, this one's gonna be a little more complicated for us in that when the first two phases, we actually just used sort of our brute strength and we moved all the furniture from one side of the room to the other and then they would do it. And then the next day we'd move it back. Um, this time, because it is office furniture with, um, you know, the modular furniture that's all put together, then it's some of it will, and shelving on the walls and things. So some of it will have to be actually disassembled and taken apart. Um, others, they do have a way to just sort of lift them up and slide the carpet tiles underneath, but will have to be closed for probably about three days um, in order for that to happen. 
I mean, or that area would have to be closed. So, um, so we're just hoping that we can keep that on track. I mean, the the um, we did check with the company, and they're keeping the original quote with us still. Um, but obviously, there's always the danger of that changing or the um, carpet tile. Um, it is a standard carpet tile. We made sure that the one that we we chose was something that was um, sort of perennially in stock, and um, and that the carpet dies because it's money a lot of different colors that it would blend easily, even if it was a, a different um, run of the of the actual carpet. So, but it, it's just something that we are um, wanting to have accomplished. So it's um, next on our Is there any question about that? I don't think anyone likes to talk on Zoom. <laughs> All righty, we'll move to the next thing. This one's a little more complicated in that we talked about this last year too. It's the retaining wall project. Um, and as it says in this thing, close to 20 years ago, I mean, we had the retaining wall that was built there. It was actually built right when I started and uh, it would be 20 years in March that I will have been with the, with the library. And, um, and we had a contractor, his name was, um, well, we won't go into names, but anyways, he was a landscaper. And so the way that it was constructed is that it was not actually a load bearing wall. It, it, and it was, it was more of a decorative wall and it didn't end up having the screening and the, the bracing and all of the, um, you know, the mesh that was supposed to be underneath there for the adequate structural support. And it also did not end up having the drainage. At the time that it was built, that entire area along the front was landscaped. It had burning uh, burning bushes. It had um, a large beech tree that was actually ended up having to be, uh, two different trees that ended up having to be taken down because over the years, what happened is the sand and the salt just eroded the the, um, the roots and the, and the tree and all the burning bushes ended up dying. So, so we have chosen not to put things in that place anymore because we know that the, the, um, it's just, it's not a, a viable place to have plantings that our, um, our perennials. Um, once we actually fix the wall, then we'll probably do something with the annuals um, um, once we are able to do that. But this will step the wall back a, a few feet, you know, and hopefully make it wide enough so that we could then work with the DPW to make that sidewalk a, a ADA accessible. Um, this has been a problem since I started. I remember the first week that I was working here, I had somebody from the council um, on disabilities talk to me about the fact that if you walk down there, you've got poles and telephone poles and, and signage right in the middle of the sidewalk and you can't get a wheelchair through. So um, we really crossed our fingers and hoped that the, eventually that the telephone poles were gonna come down and we were gonna have the wiring underneath the, the streets. But you know we've been waiting for, for that for an awfully long time and it doesn't look like it's gonna be um, close on the horizon. So. Um, this is a project that really has to be coordinated with DPW and with the other work that would be done in the center of town too. Um, and last year we deferred it because we wanted to wait to see what kinds of um, things were, were going to evolve um, with the town center. Um, I think, you know, with COVID that there hasn't been as much progress made with that as there might've been. And so, um, you know, we, we are, are understand if this would need to be um, deferred too, but right now the, biggest concern that we have is that um, because the wall, the wall is not structurally sound, it's actually gotten weak enough. So, well, first of all, we have cars that drive off the front of it. <laughs> By, I don't know if sometimes if you think it's on purpose, because we saw on the security tape, somebody actually is just trying to drive off of it. Um, and that has destroyed it. But then we also have seen, um, most recently, we, we saw um, that there were, were some kids riding bikes on a Sunday and doing like popping wheelies off the end of it. And when we came in on the Monday, there was, um, it was all broken and we were able to put it back together. But that shows you just how actually weak it is at this point. So um, even if we can't rebuild this entire wall, then I'd like to work with DPW to try to figure out a way to, um, to gain you know, um, some more safety uh, around it. Um, because it's uh, it's not really working the way that it is. Mike, did you want to add anything to that? Nope. It's uh, you know I don't have twenty years in. I've been I have five in now, but three times since I've been there, the you know somebody has driven off or it's been damaged somehow by cars. That, 
Right. It needs a guardrail. It needs some way to stop people from moving forward. That's one of the biggest parts of this, this project. Right. And we can't actually insert a guardrail into the way it is built right now because it's structurally, it's not sound enough to do it. So, I mean, we at one point had the concrete barriers that were at the ends of the parking spaces, but um, it for the plowing purposes during the winter, that was just, it was not a good situation because we only have a, the plows. Right, they got pushed around and we have certain spaces that we have to use to amass the snow and, and it just didn't work with, that way. So, I mean, this might be a larger conversation that we have to keep having, you know, and, and Paul, I don't know if you want to speak to it, but I meant we, you know, this is just, it, it's a conversation that's a little bit larger than just the retaining wall, I think, because it's all tied in with the sidewalk and, and with the center too. Okay, well, he's nodding, so. <laughs> uh, any other questions about that? Okay, let's move it on. Truck replacement. So, um, this is one that actually, when I started the very first capital planning meeting I went to 20 years ago, said truck replacement on it. <laughs> so we've been super lucky in that we have never actually purchased a brand new truck for the library. We've always been able to get the hand-me-downs from the parks department facilities or from the um, DPW. And, and I think one time from the cemetery. <laughs> so um, we are absolutely open and willing to take the hand-me-downs. The one that we have right now is, is a hand-me-down. Um, it was in from 2004. Its mileage is fairly low still, um, um, it, but it does have, ha it has had some kind of unusual repairs that um, everything from, Mike was just telling me the other day that, you know, he, he had never heard of a failed fuel tank system <laughs> in, a, in a truck. Um, um, Mike, did you want to talk about the truck at all and how we use it? No, it's, 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 it served us well, but it has a lot of underbody rot, and um, that's can. There's no escape in that. That doesn't get better. It's, it's something else is going to happen at some point. We've spent a lot of money trying to repair it. Um, when the last time that it failed with the the fuel tank system, it, we were beg borrowing and stealing time from facilities to borrow their trucks, their people to move stuff around. Um, the library needs to have some kind of a vehicle, a covered vehicle to transport things. We're happy to take a hand-me-down, but in the if that's not available, you know, yeah, that's, we're, we're struggling. Uh, Becky and Mike, it's Paul Cohn. A question I have is, it, what would be the preferred type of vehicle? Would it be a van? Would it be a pickup truck? Would it be an SUV vehicle? For, for what you transport, what's the preferred type of vehicle to have uh, in terms of vehicle uh, style? So, I mean, we obviously could take, I mean, we're, we will be willing to consider anything. The thing that we were, were looking at was a Ford 150. Um, the, which is a pickup truck. Yeah. Right. yeah okay. With, right, but, but with, a, with a covered cab, with which is cab. kind of okay. what, yeah, which is what we're doing. So the pricing that we got for that was through, um, we did both the pricing through um, the Mass Higher Education um, Consortium, MAGC, and then we also did the, um, the MassCom stuff. Um, okay. and, and it comes out that it's like 28. 32 somewhere in there, which is why we said thirty thousand. Okay, um, so a perfect world. It's a pickup truck with a cap. Okay, exactly. all right. So just want to understand what the preferred is if if there are choices. Okay, thank you. We have filled it up with boxes, the one we have now, many times. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to transport people. We just need to transport boxes of books mainly. Okay. Right, which is why covered is good because if it's raining or bad weather outside, then, then you don't want to destroy. And, and we're, this is partly in conjunction with the Friends of the Library and that they we transport a lot of materials for them too over to the to the gym where we store things and and they you know they they take those boxes and they raise between thirty and forty thousand dollars for us every every year that they have their book sales. So and unfortunately, they haven't been able to hold that <laughs> this year, but they have a lot of boxes of books now. <laughs> They're trying. Yeah, definitely. And any other questions about that? Okay, moving on. Okay, and the generator is um, what actually came from Paul as a request um, or a suggestion that we might consider that. And um, as Anybody knows when the power goes out at their house. Um, often, if the library still has power, then you know we have served as a warming center. We have set up um, 
uh, places for people to charge their phones, charge their computers. Uh, we've given out coffee. <laughs> and, um, and it's just a place that you can, you know, comfortably hang out and um, do your work. And, and we, I remember the last time that we had the big power outage here, um, you know, we were fortunate the library didn't go down. And we, we had hundreds of people just populating everywhere. Um, do you want to speak to that, Paul, at all? Or? Yeah, I mean, we should point out why this is here is in the, all the work the town has done with, um, you know, sustainability and, and hazardous mitigation and so forth. At the top of the list is the generator for the library, because as Becky noted, it does serve as a comfort station, I guess the best way to describe it. Um, people we learned over the years are reluctant to leave their homes in terms of overnight by going into shelters. But as, as was noted, they, they do look for a place to go during the daytime in either the winter for heat or summer for cooling for hours, as you said, to to be somewhere to uh, to to um, charge cell phones uh, and so forth. And and the, the need for the generator the library is the library is really near the end of the power grid for the circuit that it's on. And then also there are occasions as Becky notes, because her and I are often in communication, there are often power outages, which result in, you know, spotty outages that also rely on the, the library not being able to function because of power outages as well. Right. So, exactly. and that that's happened, you know, within the last, uh, couple months we've had that occur as well so but no this is really it's a generator for the library but it's really a generator that serves the entire community does anyone have any questions about that and and one of the things that we did do when we were open and um you know we're open for evenings um we actually extended our hours on the friday that we were in the middle of that and i remember brian and i worked later just because um, you know it's easy enough for the staff to shift their day and, and to help out when when things are like that. So, so there are any questions about that? Oh, and actually, maybe I could just also say this was you know the the details of it and the the price was uh, done in conjunction with the DPW um, based on um, the uh, um, generation generator prices that they had and um, they had researched and had installed otherwise. All right, so any overall questions? Such a fire bunch. Thank All you. All right, no problem. Thank you so much. And if anyone has any further questions or if they just after, after you know, they think about it a little, they want more clarification or details, then if you just reach out to me, um, it's just bherman at chelmsfordlibrary.com, I mean, dot org. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, I'll be happy to to help you out with that, and Mike will too. Okay. Thank you both. Yeah. Next on the agenda, we have municipal technology, and our IT director Ted Luter is in is online. Um, this project is number one in the in the uh, handout that's being shared. Hello, everybody. Good evening, Ted. Uh, this is a pretty simple um, request. Uh, I, we asked for it last year. We've asked for doors, uh, uh, f uh, some level of doors in the last couple of years. Uh, this project, project would uh, allow us to put um, all of the municipal, build municipal buildings onto our single door system. Um, the police department is um, in dire need there. Um, their door system is um, very near end of life. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think it's been in there since the since the building was um, was put up. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's very simple. We uh, uh, in the spring we uh, when COVID hit um, we were a lot. Uh, it, this allowed us to you know give cards to people at uh, town offices so that. You know, during the pandemic, we could have the building closed, but still allow our employees to get in and to, to you know, keep the, the building secure. Um, <clears throat> so we're proposing to, uh, to um, bring the police system over to our system. The, uh, the fire headquarters uh, add the, um, the fire substations, uh, the libraries, um, the North Town Hall, and the um, CCA and cemetery. Uh, 
that's the uh, that's the gist of the project. Um, happy to take any questions if anybody has any. <clears throat> Okay, if, you, if anybody has any questions at a later time, please feel free to uh, give me a call or send me an email and I'll get back to you right away. Thanks. Thank you, Deb. On the agenda that I originally sent out, I had school technology listed next. Um, if Dr. Lang is okay with it, uh, I assume he would like, you know, that would be uh, part of the presentation on school facilities, if that's a, if that works for him and Bill, um, so we can do that as the last agenda item, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine, uh, John. Not a problem. Thank you. So next on the list is municipal facilities. I saw we have uh, joining us tonight is Gary Persichetti and Kathleen Canavan. These projects are numbered 19, 19 through twenty two, which are pages eight through eleven on this handout that's being shared. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Capital Planning Committee, for letting me present tonight on these articles. The first one up is the maintenance shop treatment plant upgrade. Little history, there's three buildings that sit behind Chumpsford High School. The one I'm looking at in the picture is the one that actually houses the facility staff, along with a couple of vehicles and has a workshop in it. There's one to the left of that building, which is not part of what we're talking about tonight. And then up to the right, basically across from the PAC, the Performa Arts Center, is what we used to call the treatment plant when there was a sewer system there. That building is now used strictly for some vehicle storage and we switch off winter equipment with summer equipment. The building that you're looking at here is touching on 50 years old. It's a Morton style building, which is a complete tin building. What we are proposing is that the um, roof has been marginalized at pretty much every one of the junctions where the bolts attach to it. Um, some of the trim is gone. We have some issues with the uh, skins, which is the walls. The project would include reskinning and redoing the roof in this building taking the panels that are still good from that one and going up to the treatment plant and repairing that building to make sure that both of these buildings remain watertight. And in this particular building, it will also do insulation for it. I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Um, the next one is, this has been on the list now for five, five years. This is the three hybrid vehicles that we keep bringing on. The biggest problem we are starting to run into besides the fact of needing some vehicles is uh, DOER, Department of Energy Resources, which we are a greens community. We're not meeting the needs of bringing more vehicles within the town of Chelmsford into the hybrid or all electric class. The proposal here proposes for three new replacement facilities, and you just heard from Becky, and last meeting you heard from Deb over at the Senior Center. The proposal we have done, and I have talked with both of them, was that if we purchase these three cars, Becky would be looking at a 2012 Ford Escape, which of course is fully covered. You put the back seat down, you can put stuff in it. Uh, that's currently online, has about 60,000 miles on it and is in really good shape. Um, for Deb over at the Senior Center, we're talking about a 2013, if we were to do this, which is a Ford Escape again, which now belongs to the Board of Health, uh, also in excellent condition. And the third vehicle, which was not asked for um, to be replaced, is we have a 2005 Ford Explorer that's used by facilities to move the mail between the school department and the town back and forth. And that is definitely modulized. So the three vehicles we would be replacing is 16 years old, 14 years old, and 15. And the two things that would happen, because I have talked to Becky and Deb, is if we were to do this and these three were to go through, we'd be able to take off the $30,000 vehicle for the library 
and a 31 2 for um, the senior center, which would um, you know, take 60,200 off the capital project list if this was to go through. Any questions? Thank you. The next one is the uh, OSHA safety skylight cages and roof ladders. Um, as everyone's aware now, I think this is our second year as part of uh, OSHA. Before that, municipalities were not falling under the auspice of them. During this time, we have done uh, ladder additions to the top of roofs for safety. Before, you'd be on the top of a roof and you would have to kneel down basically on the roof to put your leg over and go down a ladder. They now have these extensions so you can walk straight up, grab onto them. There's a little door that swings open and you get out onto the roof. The other issues you have, and this happened uh, two or three years ago, we had the mega snowstorms and people were shoveling off their roofs. You may have heard of one or two or three people falling through skylights uh, while they were cleaning roofs. Happened for a couple of reasons. One, they didn't have guards on them. And two, back then, a lot of people up there were not licensed or, or typical roofers. People were looking for anyone they could to keep their buildings safe. So as part of the OSHA, it's our job to go back to buildings that we have, mostly schools, and put skylight protectors on them. This calls for 52 skylight cages and eight roof ladders. The roof ladders are additions to what I would call small roofs that you can probably take two steps up to get on. So we wanna get rid of that safety hazard as well. And to go along with this, just to let you know, we just received a $9,900 grant from uh, Maya, our insurance company, and we are doing a bunch of cages with that money. So with that money in this particular round of capital, we will have all the buildings that we have, all 28 will be secured with all of your um, skylights and have their ladders. Any questions? Okay, if, if not, the next one is the uh, CCA insulation, insulation project. Um, Kathleen has worked on this and getting the numbers, so I'll have her explain it to you better than I can. Kathleen, please. Sure. The Center for the Arts, what I'm proposing is a second a renovation to bring it up to current energy codes. This would involve putting sprayed, SPF sprayed polyurethane foam in the roof of the attic and then blown in cellulose insulation in the walls. Currently, the air handler is in the attic of the, of the uh, CCA, right above the auditorium. And in years past, we've had trouble um, keeping occupants happy and attaining thermal comfort in this space due to air stratification. And the past couple of winters, we did have to close the CCA down or some performances in the really cold weekends of January and February because we could only get the seating area to be about 60 to 64 degrees. So this is a great opportunity to um, maximize the energy code and usage of the building and reduce electrical costs and in, improve the thermal comfort of the occupants. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank you, Kathleen and Gary. Next on the agenda, we move to facilities and technology, and we have Dr. Lang with us this evening and also Bill Silva, Director of Technology. These projects are, no are numbered um, are pay on pages 12 through 23, and I just wanted to point out to everyone that they are the reason the project numbers don't go in numerical order is these are presented in the order that um, the priority number that um, according to Dr. Lang's memo. So good evening, Dr. Lang. Good evening, John. How are you? Fine, thank you. And you? Good. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having us uh, this evening. We do have um, uh, Bill Silver, our technology director, uh, Brian Crilly, our facilities director, and Joanna Johnson Collins, our director of uh, finance and operations. 
with us in case any uh, questions come up, but I'll just quickly review the uh, school projects before you this evening. Um, the first one is, is actually the only technology related project um, we have this year. We, if you recall, um, two years ago, uh, set out to do a three year upgrade um, and improvement to all of our uh, security cameras and uh, it, um, security infrastructure within the uh, public schools. So uh, two years ago, we were able to fund uh, improvements at both Parker and McCarthy Middle Schools. Um, this past year, uh, Capital funded uh, a complete upgrade and renovation to our security system at Chelmsford High School. And then this is the third and final year of the um, three-year initiative to upgrade and add um, security uh, cameras and equipment at each of our elementary schools. Um, so this would cover the uh, Byam Center, Harrington, and South Row Elementary Schools. Again, it's the uh, third year and third and final year of a uh, three-year program. Uh, this would include adding uh, interior uh, security cameras as well as exterior uh, security cameras at each of these uh, four elementary schools, um, tying in the uh, door locking uh, mechanisms to our uh, centralized system. And uh, again, just upgrading different um, um, controlling and, and viewing monitors both within the school um, so that we can um, see what's going on. And all of this would be tied back into uh, central office as well as the uh, police station. So this is the one and only uh, technology project for this year. And again, as we do go through these projects, John had mentioned, um, we review these with the school committee and uh, we know money is always tight year to year. So the school committee does go through a process of prioritizing all of the uh, school department related projects um, so I'm presenting to you, I am presenting them to you in uh, priority order. So this is the, uh, the first one related to school technology and security. Any questions on this one? Okay, um, project number two is um, door hardware upgrades. And again, uh, this has actually been a project that's been going on for um, probably four, three or four years at this point, and we still have another year or two um, to go. Uh, this is the project um, this in fiscal 22 that would impact uh, Byam, Harrington, and Westlands. And this is work that's done in coordination with um, Gary and Kathleen over in DPW to upgrade the uh, door hardware uh, in the interior and exterior of the uh, classrooms to um, go through and uh, replace um, old hardware make it um, accessible hardware, um, rekeying when necessary and bringing everything up to um, code compliance within the schools. Um, I think you know, the administration, the school committee as well also view this as a very um, highly important project again, because it does touch on uh, school safety and school security. And this was a multi-year project after this um, year. I believe we have one or two uh, other elementary schools and this multi-year project would be completed as well. Questions on door hardware? Okay. Um, next is a um, kind of a funky, uh, it's called an elevator, but it's really a lift, um, which is on the exterior of uh, Parker Middle School um, to make the outside of Parker uh, Middle School um, handicap accessible for uh, students who are in wheel wheelchairs. Um, Actually, you know, Gary, I'm sure someone else could uh, add to this if there are questions, but I believe some years back, um, it was determined that this uh, was a good solution to add a lift on the exterior parker to be able to access, again, that central uh, core on the outside of the building. It's worked uh, fine for, um, for what we need to be able to get uh, students up and down uh, to that particular level who were in uh, wheelchairs. It's just this particular um, enclosure and structure is in um, need of a repair. Uh, so last year we did have it uh, flagged and we had it on the capital list. It didn't quite make the cut. Um, I think you'll see with a lot of the other projects on here, they don't uh, do better with age. Uh, so it's really just a year older and uh, continues to need uh, an upgrade. Um, so some people do refer to it as the exterior elevator at Parker. Um, some refer to it as the exterior lift. Uh, but it's a singular um, unit that's in the, um, the outside courtyard at Parker School, and it is in uh, rough shape and in need of a, uh, of a replacement. Um, so that's before you as the uh, school committee's third priority for this year. Any questions on that? 
Okay. Um, fourth project before you is a, um, a kitchen uh, code compliance upgrade. And this one uh, impacts South Row Elementary School. We actually uh, did a lot of work um, at South Row this past um, school year. As you know, the, uh, a good portion of the roofs at South Row were replaced, um, as well as the roof that's over the uh, kitchen. The uh, skylights were replaced. It really looks great. They have a new drop ceiling in. Um, we have some new uh, service lines at the school, so it really does look uh, wonderful. The, um, the, all the different uh, ventilation up on the roof was replaced while we were there, but there is an exhaust um, hood in the uh, kitchen that you can see in the picture uh, right over the different ovens and uh, warming stations that's in need of a uh, replacement. Um, so the uh, hood itself and all the duct work uh, needs to be replaced with um, uh, energy saving variable speed um, systems. And this is coming in just under $80,000. And uh, again, this would actually kind of uh, firm up and this is the last thing we really have to do at um, the South Row. Um, I didn't know we were fully gonna be able to do it last year, but we were able to put the money together to upgrade the uh, refrigerator and freezer at the school that was previously on a list that we were able to knock off. And uh, again, we have the new roof, we've got the new skylights, the new service line. So this will really complete the uh, kitchen over at South Row. And that's on uh, for you for consideration as well. Uh, next project is also kitchen related. Um, last year, if you may recall, um, well, we have four major um, kind of service kitchens in the district. Um, last year, we came before you and we're in process right now of um, redoing the entire uh, Parker kitchen. Um, we also have a, a service kitchen at uh, Westlands, McCarthy and the high school. And these are uh, relatively um, large numbers. Parker, McCarthy and the high school are, we're all in excess of a half a million dollars. The, uh, the Westland kitchen is slightly um, less. When we were doing our uh, prioritization of the kitchens, um, and we were trying to kind of stagger out some of our funding requests from year to year. We uh, slid the Westlands in uh, here because we felt um, we almost needed to take a small break after the uh, large kitchen we did at uh, Parker. But uh, the kitchen before you for 22 is Westlands. Again, uh, the Westland School is used by both um, the community education program as well as the uh, CHIPS preschool program. So the kitchen would be used to both service um, and provide breakfast and lunch to kids during the school during the day. And then there is also a piece um, in the evening time that I'm still trying to quantify and I hope to by the time uh, we get together next week, uh, be able to see if there is a portion of this uh, that we might be able to allocate to the community ed revolving fund. Uh, because there is a piece of this that is going to be making a, um, a separate area because you have to have separation between the day program and any kind of um, adult ed or after school offering programs, almost for a, uh, like a test kitchen, a um, um, classroom type kitchen, because they do host um, both student as well as adult, um, say cooking classes, things along those lines. And we wanna uh, segregate that from the regular cooking kitchen, uh, which has just different um, code and regulations. Um, so again, out of that dollar amount, the 227, there is gonna be a piece. I don't think it's a, um, a significant piece, but I'm trying to figure out and back into a number that we can justify that we could allocate to the um, community ed program because there is a piece of this project that is gonna be building out that um, educational space or that kind of test kitchen that they're gonna be using in their programs. Um, but this uh, current year in 22, we're asking for the uh, Westlands kitchen to be upgraded. And then just to forecast for you for the next two years, these are bigger projects and they are both very much needed. Uh, the McCarthy kitchen and then the high school kitchen rounds it out in 24. Um, next pick, um, sorry, next project is actually relatively smaller for us. Um, this is a replacement of uh, some of the bathroom uh, urinal petitions at uh, Center Elementary School. Again, we've done a nice job with upgrades in uh, bathrooms in schools over the last number of years. And um, this is a particular project just to finish out the, uh, the center bathrooms. We'd like to update the uh, petitions. You can see that they're rusting out at the bottom. And uh, it's not a hugely significant project dollar wise, but aesthetically and uh, use wise, it would be important to the, uh, to the students at the school. Um, so this would be to replace all of the um, bathroom petitions with a more of a phenolic uh, material that wouldn't um, rust much, much like the, uh, the, metal, um, the metal units do at this point. So that is over at um, Center Elementary School. Next 
just a couple of more uh, projects. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this next one before you um, was actually on the list last year. It didn't get funded. It got bumped uh, and then had to get reprioritized this year as well. Uh, but this would be to do some um, uh, cleaning, repair, and servicing of the existing HVAC ductwork in the air handling systems at uh, Byam, Harrington, and Westlands. Um, this was identified in the uh, Dorn Whittier report we had done a few years ago as, um, as an item. Again, it, it does need to be done. This is something that um, didn't quite make the cut last year, so it did remain on the, uh, the list. Um, but the uh, air handlers uh, do need a little bit of servicing. They need some repair, and uh, they do need a cleaning at these uh, three particular schools. Um, so that project is before you for consideration as well. Jay, quick question on that. Is, are any of these included in the HVAC assessment projections for, that was just completed? Any of these uh, project costs? No, the um, okay. the the assess well the one we'll probably talk about in a little bit. Um, yeah, that was much more related to the educational spaces within the building. So that okay. would be like the classrooms themselves, the unit events in the classrooms. Um, this is more of like the behind the scenes, um, you know, okay. duct work and and uh, cleaning that's necessary, and uh, some small repairs. We certainly would check and make sure we're not being duplicitous in uh, anything okay. that we're doing. But I do believe this is separate. Uh, okay. Paul, okay. Jay, I can jump in there a minute. This has to do the duct cleaning, specifically the kitchens and the gyms. Okay. So thank that you. really wasn't identified in the HVAC assessment. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, next project for me is um, just some flooring uh, repair and upgrades. Again, what we tried to do was um, pull together, these can be relatively smaller projects, but sometimes you get to a point where um, you need to actually go in and it's a um, more substantial number. Um, you know, obviously if we just went to a particular area, you might be able to do it for a few thousand dollars, fix something. But from time to time, you end up getting um, a number of tiles or it's on a particular uh, uneven surface. So the tiles crack. So there is about $30,000 worth of uh, VCT work uh, that's needed at uh, Harrington in the uh, cafeteria and the hallways leading to the cafeteria. Um, this is a project you've seen before. Um, it's kind of been kicking around for a couple of years and it just doesn't uh, quite make the cut. Um, you know, again, it doesn't come into kind of one of those, you know, uh, life safety type situations. It's more aesthetics. And um, at some point, we're going to have to um, move forward and make those repairs. We try to do, you know, kind of patchwork repairs as we go. Uh, but at some point, it really is uh, necessary to just pull it up and uh, put it down right so that we don't have to keep dealing with it. Uh, but this is just VCT repair um, of broken <clears throat> tiles at uh, the cafeteria at Harrington School. Um, next project before you this evening uh, was also on the list last year. We were really hoping to be able to do this when we um, uh, move forward with the auditorium renovation at McCarthy Middle School. Uh, we were hoping to be able to upgrade the uh, student lecture hall, which is in the room kind of right adjacent to the, um, the auditorium. Uh, we originally thought that we were going to be able to find some economy of scale and doing it at the same time, particularly with the seating and the flooring contractors. When we uh, went out to bid and get the actual um, dollar amounts for the cost for the uh, lighting and the sound and the seating and the flooring for the auditorium, it actually came in higher than what our capital uh, budget number was for 21. So if you recall this past um, October, we went back to town meeting for two projects. And this is one of the two projects that was the auditorium at McCarthy that we were able to get the extra money to be able to finalize that. So that's actually in process at this point, which is great. Uh, but we did not have enough money and we were not able to kind of find the economy of scale to um, to pull off the lecture hall at McCarthy um, School as well. So um, these are uh, updated uh, numbers. We do feel that the 110 would be able to satisfy the seating and the lighting and the flooring um, at the school. And uh, so this is now before he was a standalone project. Again, you may have heard of it because we did talk about it last year. It just didn't quite um, make it money wise into the auditorium rehab. Um, so now it is a standalone project that's back on our list for consideration. Um, <clears throat> well, we've got a couple more. The, um, the next one, and again, this is something that we're going to see um, over the next couple of years. We do have some aging elevators. Um, we had looked at the um, Parker lift a little bit earlier, and that certainly is the priority for this year. But um, the uh, McCarthy elevator is in need of a uh, replacement. 
I think um, a year from now, we'll also be looking at um, Parker, the high school elevator needs a little bit of work. So some of our elevators in our buildings are reaching the age where they need to be replaced. I think, um, you know, we're obviously doing a very good job and the town is as well as maintaining and keeping our existing buildings um, up. The buildings are aging though. And uh, sometimes these systems do need to be replaced. Um, of the three or four elevators in the district that um, really do need some work over the next number of years, the uh, McCarthy's was um, the most in need. So the McCarthy elevator is added to the list this year. Um, we are gonna work over the course of the year to make sure that we have all of the other elevators in uh, sequence for future capital requests. Um, but for our immediate need, the uh, McCarthy elevator is the one that uh, has been flagged in year one uh, to proceed forward. So you have that elevator project in front of you. <clears throat> um, second to last for me is the um, boilers at the high school. <clears throat> and again, I'm not trying to put them on the spot, but Gary may be able to um, talk a little bit about the actual age of them, but the uh, boilers at the high school are nearing the point where they need to be um, replaced. If you uh, think about it um, in the scheme of things, I think the HVAC system obviously will be getting some uh, tweaks in the coming um, months just for some uh, repairs and updates and recommendations based on the previous report we had completed, but it is time to start replacing uh, the boilers at the school. I think they've, they've served the school well. I think, in this, again, in the scheme of things, this is a relatively small scale project when you're looking at numbers related to HVAC uh, equipment. Gary, do you, again, not trying to put you on the spot, but do you happen to know um, when the existing boilers went in and um, age-wise where they're at? Sure, um, the high school was my first project with the new 95% condensing boilers. They're 20 years old. Um, they have served us extremely well. We've had very small amounts of breakdowns. They are nearing the end of their life. And what we propose to do is replace the boilers here take the boilers that are existing and keep those for pots because Carrington, Byam, and Carrington, Byam, and uh, what am I missing? Carrington, Byam, and Westlands, excuse me, all have the same boilers. So this will give us the opportunity to use the pots that are still good within these boilers to keep those going in prolong their life expectancy. Um, as everyone knows, when we started this project 20 years ago, first year out, it saved $81,000 in electrical, um, well, gas costs, and it's maintained that through the years, and we believe we'll be able to do the same thing again. Great. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Um, and our, our last project before you <clears throat> is a it's, it is a big project that um, we've had on the docket for a couple of years. It keeps kind of getting kicked year to year. Um, this would be a complete um, replacement, uh, you know, down to the ground and starting over with the um, tennis courts at Chelmsford High School, the basketball courts, uh, the street hockey uh, facility, the court over there as well. Um, this would be a complete um, kind of scratch and redo of that entire complex at the high school. And, um, it, you know, it certainly is something that um, we would like to do. We think it would add a lot of value to the school. Um, speaking for the school committee, I know it's just, it's a big number. And looking at the particular projects we had this year, it was just uh, difficult to um, think about allocating a million two to that particular project. Um, doesn't mean it's anything less than we want to do. We certainly want to be able to accomplish this project, but given other needs, um, it kind of dropped to the bottom of the uh, the list. But we want to make sure this did stay on the list because this has been talked about for a number of years. And um, I do know that even you know, as we if this project doesn't move forward, there are still annual costs that um, the town incurs for um, you know resurfacing and patching and. Uh, weeding on the tennis courts and the basketball courts. Um, so even though it is a big number at some point in time, it certainly is going to need to be done uh, because you're going to have to take a look at that annual recurring costs um, to maintain it. And uh, it will make sense at some point to, uh, to do that. But that does round out our um, capital projects for the year. Uh, uh, just on this court replacement, Gary, what, what is the age of the court surface and what do you think and Kathleen think it may cost if to make those surfaces playable this summer for basketball and tennis? Uh, Paul, the last few years, uh, we spent about 
24 to 32,000 doing crack repairs in the tennis courts. And they last about two years. They can go through two freeze thaw cycles before the courts become pretty cracked and unplayable. We spent 18,000 on a basketball court. Yeah. Uh, and where we're, where we're heading is um, we're gonna be looking at, the, at those costs rising until we get to this project. I would think that we're probably looking at close to 50,000 um, coming out of this year to get both of those up and running, especially where, you know, you've had a couple, this past light year of COVID not having a lot going on out there, but they are gonna have to be ready for when things reopen. And the next, hopefully the final question I have is, if this project were funded, when would the work take place? In other words, if you do it during the summer, then you're not using the courts for basketball and tennis in the summer. Or is this a fall project? In other words, if we get funding at town meeting in end of April and the beginning of May, when when would you envision, if the funding were there, that this project would actually be performed? I would believe that we would we would we're going to have to have something's going to have to suffer a little, and we'd have to decide which sport or which um, point that we'd want that to be. Uh, because there's, it's going to be physically, I think, impossible to get this done uh, when there's absolutely no sports that are out there. Um, so I think it's going to be a combination of um, looking at the, the school's needs of sports on that particular year that it's funded, number one, to see when that's happening. And number two, uh, this is an item very much I put it in a classification with lockers and items that do not have many vendors that do it. And once they get busy, you're apt to um, lose a whole season. So it's one that we'd have to be out there early with our shit in there so that we are one of their top projects because it, it is rather, rather large. So I know that's not a complete answer, Paul, but I, I think it's a matter of working with the school department on what's, what season or what portion of a season season they rather give up to get this done. Is varsity tennis a fall sport? Jay, is that a fall sport or a spring sport? No, uh, boys and girls tennis is both spring. Spring. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. You know, again, just timing wise, I know it's, it's difficult because we wouldn't get the funding until April it'd be very difficult to, to bid and mobilize for like a summer. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. um, you know, from our perspective, uh, it would probably make sense to have everything in line uh, so that if that did you know, get approved, you'd go out to bid, you know, early May, get a project um, awarded and try over the course of that fall uh, before the winter to, um, to get things done. That would be ideal as opposed to waiting until the springtime. But um, it would just really have to be lined up so that all your bids were ready to go. And you really, there are, you know, when it comes to tennis courts, there's three companies in the area like New England that I even know of that would be like um, competent to do something like that. So they are very difficult, as Gary said. They line up, they work well in advance, and you just have to kind of hope you fall into a cycle where they can um, accommodate you. Thank you. Thank you. Is any any um, any members of the committee have any questions for Dr. Lang or his administration team on any of the projects that we've heard? We're not seeing anyone. Jill, was that? Did you have a question? No, I think my question really is more like timeframes of projects, and, and there's just so many of them. It'll be kind of hard to say, but. Um, one would be that tennis court project and thinking of the sports teams and if it was in the fall, how long would it take? Would it be like multiple weeks? Would it be a month? You know, that kind of thing. And then um, the other projects um, as far as like the kitchens and the schools and then the, the, the disruption period that that would have and just those kind of questions. So nothing specific, <laughs> just thinking out loud. Just a quick answer to that would be uh, similar to what uh, we just explained on the tennis courts. All of it is basically happens with when you get out to bid, when your bids come back in, and what the business busyness is of vendors. 
Um, we can just tell you that um, we're all, it's a hard thing to say, but COVID has, has really played a havoc in this particular um, cycle, not only because of what's going on, every vendor has been having trouble getting what they've needed based on the fact that certain goods through this whole COVID, plastics, um, as you know, there's been with that for um, cleaning supplies for anything. Uh, we have do, we, we, the, one of the projects we're doing now, which is the Parker School Kitchen. We have a door vendor um, for overhead doors that has had a real big problem with getting some of the parts based on the fact that it's a certain kind of metal. We're hoping all of that goes away and gets back to normal at some point, which will start to bring these projects back into what we expect them to be. But it has played a part, and I think it's going to continue to for a little while while this is all getting worked out. But we do like to try to do most of school projects over the summer months, if at all possible. Um, door hardware, uh, which is one that's up this time. For us, that's a very easy project because they don't mind second shift. They don't mind doing it on the off hours. So that doesn't matter if it runs into it. Uh, we coordinate directly with the principals once the job is started. So all the meetings usually can uh, take place with the facilities the school department and the principals and we decide what gets done. So it all can be done. Thank you, Gary. Any other questions from the committee? Okay, not seeing any. Um, next we we'll move on to the, um, I don't, I'm looking at the participants. I don't see any members of the public, but would it, is there anyone in the, in the room that would like to make um, public comments about any of the projects that we've heard? Okay, not, not seeing anyone. Um, one thing I wanted to mention that, that Chris reminded me of is um, before next the next meeting, I'll be sending out a the usual, um, the Excel spreadsheet that we've used in the past. It's kind of like a worksheet to all the committee members. And I think it's worked good. It's helped us make good use of time at the third meeting so that you can, each member can prioritize and rank the projects that they think should be funded and then send that to me and then we'll share that at the third meeting. So I will be sending that out. Um, is there any, does anyone have on the committee any other comments or? None for me. Okay, great. Um, our next meeting will be next Thursday, December 17th. Um, I think we've covered all of the subjects tonight. Uh, unless anyone has anything, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Motion by Chris. Second. Do I have a second? Second by Jeff. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. aye. All those opposed? Okay, unanimous. Okay, we'll see everyone back on um, next Thursday, the 17th. Thank you for Thank your time. You. Thank you. Bye all. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you.